All right. Well, good uh, afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to today's session of Two Points of View at two, and it is two here in Central Time anyway. Um, make that go away. I'm Rex Black, president of RBCS, a worldwide testing and quality assurance firm serving clients ranging from small startups to Fortune 20 global enterprises. And since 1994, we have delivered insight and confidence to hundreds of clients around the world. Uh, we have a team of international consultants that deliver customized training, consulting, and expert services to companies that are looking to improve their test and quality assurance practices. Uh, so today, I am happy to welcome uh, one of uh, one of the folks who's been a client of mine in a in a past life when he was uh, working at a, a large retail organization that shall remain nameless here because uh, I, I think my contract said I wasn't supposed to use their name without their explicit permission. Um, yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, I'm happy to welcome uh, Mike Lyles to this presentation. Uh, this is a interesting topic discussions testers should no longer be having um, and i would sort of add to that if we ever were supposed to be having them right <laughs> mike mm -hmm. is a director of qa and project management with over 25 years of experience at multiple organizations including fortune 50 companies uh, exposure he has exposure in various it leadership roles such as software development pmo software testing um, he's led various teams within testing organizations, such as functional test groups, test environment groups, software configuration management teams, test data management, always fun, performance testing, test automation, service virtualization, all things that everybody listening should be familiar with. And um, if you're not, you go, go out and get familiar with them because they're important Absolutely. for us. Uh, Mike has been successful in career development, team building, coaching, and mentoring of IT and QA professionals. He's been an international keynote speaker at multiple conferences and events and is regularly published in test and publications and magazines. And his first motivational book, The Drive Through Is Not Always Faster, was released in 2019. And that is most definitely a, a good a good title and a true observation because drive throughs yeah, definitely not always faster. Right. Um, <laughs> you can learn more about Mike at, uh, this is amazing enough, www.mikewliles.com. That's Lyles, L-Y-L-E-S. Uh, there's a W in the middle there, right. uh, .com, where you can also find his social media links and connect with him as well. And his book is at www.thedrivethroughbook.com. Um, at least it is now until he gets sued by Popeyes or, or Wendy's or something like that for uh, a <laughs> for a commentary about drive-throughs and not how they're not always faster. So <laughs> hopefully we'll not be joining the land, the, the, the ranks of the litigated against. So today, Mike and I are going to discuss a number of well-known phrases, philosophies, theories, and stuff that comes up in the context of testing, often in coming out of the mouths of people who aren't necessarily very well informed about testing. So how do we overcome those obstacles to be successful? And I'll point out at any point, if you have questions, uh, submit them via the uh, Q&A webinar interface, but note that we'll only answer them at the end. So Mike, take it away. Thank you so much, Rex. I, I you know, the, the company not to be named, um, the, big, the big giant retailer that we work <laughs> together with, you know, I, I really enjoyed that because, you know, I've been following Rex. For those of you that are here, you're probably here because you know Rex and his reputation, but... Uh, I remember the first time I got an opportunity to to work with Rex. Um, the first day on his job, I brought two books and said, "You got to sign these because <laughs> I've read your stuff and I've followed your stuff for years, and you know I have a lot of respect for what Rex does." Um, and we seem to have met at conferences. My very first conference I ever spoke at in 2012 in Miami, Florida, um, just not long ago, nine years ago. <laughs> um, was with Rex. We talked about metrics and 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 a, and a program that we put together at that retailer. So mm -hmm. um, a lot of good, a lot of good experiences, Rex. And we've we've seen each other a lot along the way. I'm really excited about these because one of the things I did is I reached out to the testing community, started asking people, you know, what what discussions do you have that you wish you didn't have to have today? And I knew it was going to come out this way, you know, because really what people are giving me are things that they are, uh, as someone in the community said to me, these are discussions you should be having. Um, 
but I think what people mean when they say these are discussions I don't want to have, they're saying these are things that we have a discussion in a different way than we should be having them. So mm -hmm. I had a whole laundry list of about 30, 40, 50 things that people gave me. Um, we can spend, we could spend 45 minutes or an hour, two hours talking about those, <laughs> but I narrowed it down to five and we're probably going to touch on some of these, but I think, um, we definitely, uh, for those of you that are here, we want to hit on number five at the end, because I think that one is an interesting one for me and for Rex, because I think that's where we feel that we're probably the most, there's a gap. Um, and, but we'll go through these and we'll see how it plays out. Um, We'll start with number one. The first one, and I think the, the number one that, that I got always was, how do we miss this in testing? You hear it. <laughs> yeah. Everybody heard it. You know, everybody hears it when they when they first, uh, when, when you know, your first role in testing, first job, first week, first month, you're going to hear that. You know, how do we miss this? And so, um, you know, <laughs> I, I felt like uh, my, my suggestion to people when they when they hear that is, um, you know, you're you're. you're your impulse is to say, you know, it's not my fault. It's, you know, I didn't break it. I don't break anything. I find it broken mm -hmm. and to, to be, you know, um, defensive about it. But I think one of the things that I feel that our team should be doing there in that situation is saying, um, you know, what can I do to take charge of this? You know, yes, I hear you. I hear you asking me, how did we miss it in testing, but how do we turn that story around and turn it into a, a lessons learned? And, and I start, you know, I take charge of um, owning the uh, finding of where, where did it break down? You know, did it break down in requirements? Did it break down in design? Did the client know what they wanted? Did the developer know what the client wanted? Did we have a problem in development? Did we have a problem in test design? You know, where did we fail? And, and really spending our energies on taking that initiative and building it out. So. Right. I Getting into root cause, root cause analysis. Right. I mean, yeah. You know, okay. Whereas there is a process gap, um, you know, to some extent, that process gap may have been in testing, but it's probably also in other places, too. I mean, yeah. my, my sort of knee jerk reaction to this as, as a consultant, I, I agree that, you know, as a as, as somebody who's actually in the role, it's not helpful to to come across as defensive. But when I hear clients asking that of their own QA teams, my comment to management will be, well, why did the developers put it in there? you know and and <laughs> yes. they'll kind of give me this funny look and i'll say well the answer is going to be the same thing right there's some sort of gap in the process and software engineering is hard and you can spend an almost infinite amount of time and you know not not do it infallibly right so yeah, yeah. i think that's a, I think that's a good one to push back on but I, I like the idea of yeah let's instead of it getting into some sort of you know gargantuan urination match about you know who's <laughs> who's you know whose mistake is is higher up the tree right you just say yeah. well look i mean we have gaps in our process that are going to result in us missing things and if we you know let's focus on missing missing the right things right um i mean one of the things yeah. that i do with clients is I, I like to have metrics in place as you know and I look at defect detection effectiveness which you know is looking at exactly that right like what what percentage of defects get missed but I usually like to actually look at that as two metrics as they, there's defect detection effectiveness overall. But then I also say, well, let's look at defect detection effectiveness uh, just for the high priority defects. Right. Yeah. And so my point will be, uh, hey, let's let's tighten up the process, but let's tighten up the process with respect to the high priority defects. You know. Right. So, um, you know, that's really kind of where I would go. So, yeah, I, I like that. I, I'm, I'm a fan of not. Uh, not having that discussion, or at least not having it the traditional way, right? Of the correct of correct. you know the the you know who's because traditionally it's whose fault is it, right? Yes. And yes. You know, how did we miss this in testing? Comment is basically a form of anchoring the discussion, right? Of like saying, I assert that this is testing's <sighs> fault, right? And now it's it's devolves to the tester to try to refute it, and that's you know. It's kind of like something one of my managers once said of uh, it had involved in a very brutal meeting and he, he came out of it. And he said, you know, and all these guys in the meeting are like trying to shoot holes under my feet and they don't realize we're all in the same boat. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, it's just that the boat sinks and, you know, who cares, 
you know, whether the water came in under my feet or their feet, you know, so. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, that's exactly. a good one. Yeah. So I think we're going to get through five and we're going to have like two that we disagree on. So this is good. We're searching <laughs> for that disagreement. Um, um, it's waiting at the end for sure. <laughs> there you go. We put the good, we saved the best for life. Um, the, the, the second one was, can you explain why your estimates are so long? I think there's a lot of pushback on that, you know, and mm -hmm. I think there's a, um, my, uh, per, my response to that. And, and I think this might be one where we start to see a little bit of a gap in our, in our, our way of responding to that Rex is I have really got intimate with mind mapping and, and it's something that I have used to uh, bridge the communication with the teams. I find that from a, as we move into agile teams and we've got teams that are using, you know, scrum ceremonies and, and we've got uh, project managers looking at use cases and scrum masters looking at use cases and, and, and people looking at different things and testers looking at test plans and test documentation, I feel like my map kind of bridges that gap. Um, and it kind of helps people to understand um, how, how we got to where we got, you know, so if I can show you on a mind map, what are my functions I'm covering and, and really try to put as much detail into the mind map as I can. I think it helps um, explain why our estimates are long. Um, but you know, it also, it doesn't give you a, a, a long detail of it, you know, step-by-step step why, it's, why it's longer. So, yeah, you know, I'll turn it over and let you yeah, give your I, input there. Th yeah, we're going to have a little bit of a disagreement there because I, I, you know, for one thing, I've never really quite got mind maps. They just struck me as two-dimensional outlines, um, <laughs> you know, spread out over the, over the page. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to get an outline, but I don't know what spreading it out over the page does for me necessarily. I think that the thing, the thing that people trip up on, and this is even, I've recently ran into this with a, with a client, a very experienced QA director, and she's been in IT for just for quite, quite some time. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, and no, that's not COVID. Uh, it's just dry air. Uh, but she, she you know, uh, we're, we're talking about how long things are going to take. And they're running, they're spooling this, this estimate past me. And I'm like, okay, guys, you have explained to me how long it's going to take for you to create your tests. And you've explained how long it's going to take for me to run every one of your tests once. You are not telling me when you're going to be done. And they're like, what do you mean? I'm like, are you planning your testing on the assumption that you're not going to find any defects that need to be fixed? Is that what you're doing here? Because if so, that's <laughs> one of the super critical yeah. mistakes, test estimation mm -hmm. mistakes, the test managers, test professionals make all the time. And not just test professionals. I mean, everybody does this like, oh, we'll test it and then we'll be done with it. Like, no, 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 no. You'll test it and you'll find way more bugs and technical debt than anyone would believe was there. Uh, yeah. That always happens. People are always unpleasantly surprised by the amount of problems. I have yet to be on a project where the testing went you know, quote unquote, smoothly and, in, 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 you know, in the sense of who would, you know, the way that people would think of the word smoothly. So I, I really think that it's very important that when you're talking about the estimation that is that you, you really be able to quantify, okay, this is how long it takes to, to create the tests. Yes. And this is how long it'll take to get through running them. This is how many defects we expect to find. And this is how long it typically takes us to get those defects fixed. And yeah. that last bit, the, how long it takes to get the defects fixed is almost always the long pole in the tent. Um, you know, so I, I think that's, that's something to me well, that's really critical is be able to get that, that into people's heads. Well, our CEO made a great statement in one of our town hall meetings the other day. And he said, it's not the work that gets us. It's the rework. That gets us, right? <laughs> exactly. You know? um, exactly. And, and so I, I think that is, is a true statement. Um, you know, and, and we, mm -hmm. we talk about that a lot in our team. Um, never, I do never time to do it right the first time, but there's always yeah. time to do it over, right? I mean, it's that, that's <laughs> the old, the old saying. Yeah. Um, I see a question from someone here, and I'm, and I'm watching it. I think it, it, we can blend this into this talk here. It sure. Says, can we like. can we use planning poker to estimate each story for better estimation instead of estimation done by a single person? And you know what? I I think that's an interesting thing, Rex, because um, you know how does how does 
doing planning poker and agile, you know, planning, story planning um, affect maybe the groups, you know, if you got three testers on the team and, you know, we're starting, we, we have to, we have to agree, right? We have to agree in the sure. poker session. Um, how do you think that affects, you know, the overall, do I get mm -hmm. my way, right? And, well, and I, I don't know if that does that or not. I think it. I think it can, provided that the that the testers are there, insisting that with, that the conversation not just be how long it's going to take to create the test and run it, but how long it's going to take to fix the defects that are found. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think that's that's the thing. Is that planning poker has to, if it's going to be user any form of estimation, really has to be realistic. That's why I, I like um, in agile settings incorporating um, uh, the. A risk analysis of the sprint backlog into the uh, sprint planning session, right? So you get to go through the process of selecting the, the sprint content and then immediately do a risk analysis on that. So you're looking at, well, you know, how many bugs you're going to find, how bad are they going to be, those sort of things, right? And then you yeah. go into the estimation and then people are already primed to think about this issue of, oh, yeah, we're going to find problems, right? Right. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Cool. Well, on to number three. Yeah. So usability is not a bug. We had a lot of people that, that that shared with me that they were getting a lot of pushback on usability issues that they were <laughs> logging. And, um, you know, my response to that was, and, and the folks that I've talked to about this, um, mm -hmm. my mentor said to me, you know, 90s was a sales lead, a sales led growth period, you know, 2000s was marketing led. And then now today we're you can't get enough marketing. Everybody's marketing, but you, you've got to have products that you know, are usable, mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's a reason that Apple wins on usability, you know, across the board, because it's just easier to use sometimes than others. I mean, I love Samsung products and I've considered going to a Samsung phone many times, but the Apple products kind of stick with me because I know it's just easy, you know, and it, everything kind of mm -hmm. connects for me, but, um, you know, there's a lot of discussions around usability, you know, is usability really, you know, if, if someone I've had a lot of, I had people in, um, I'll, I'll share something from my company, which is not proprietary, but we had a project manager on a team that was logging defects as he called them um, orphan defects, because he said, these are defects that are not related to anything, not related to requirements, they're orphans. And I said, well, no, they have a home. The home is this project, you know? So <laughs> I, I think that's uh, definitely... I think that's where a lot of people are getting wrapped around the axle on this mm -hmm. is, you know, that, you know, usability, you're, you're testing things that are, it's, is it usable? Is it not? And that's not really functionality, but I do think that we need to, we need to test those things now because that's critical. You sure. Know, it makes or break a company. I guess the only, the only, uh, and this isn't necessarily a disagreement kind of a, a refinement to that is I would say that empowering your QA team, your, your test team, whatever, whatever they're called, the people who do the functional testing, empowering them to report usability problems is great, but it is not a substitute for having UX people and an actual usability tester or testers in your organization, because yeah. uh, that it's, it's an extremely uh, nuanced and sophisticated field, uh, very much like security and you you know it's 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 not it's not that it's somebody who's an amateur and i'm, I'm saying amateur here in the real sense of that word amateur not the, the slang us way that term gets used is to mean an <laughs> idiot or an incompetent person right but amateur meaning somebody who is not a professional who doesn't do that for a living and if you have people who are amateurs doing use all your usability testing and all your security testing, it's really only a short period of time before something bad happens to you. Mm -hmm. So I would say, yeah, for sure. You want your, your functional testers thinking about security defects. You want them thinking about performance defects. You want them thinking about usability defects. Yep. But you also want to have specialists in those areas with special skills who are professionals who can actually do those jobs uh, correctly, I would well, say. Well, that is an interesting take. So you think that needs to be somebody that's not, you know, because a lot of times in a small, you know, in a larger companies, I've led teams where, you know, you you are a functional tester. That's what you do 24 mm -hmm. hours a day, you know, yep. eight hours a day. Um, or you're a um, automation or a performance tester. And, you, and those are, you know, and you hear a lot of people in the community talking about if you're automation, that needs to be all you do, right? 
Mm-hmm. Um, and, I, and I've led some really large teams of 100, 150 people. But my team right now is 12, 13 people. And some of our people wear many hats. You know, somebody's doing, I've got one person that can do, that's in this call right now to ask that question, that can do oh. automation, performance, and security. Um, I've got a, I've got people that can do all three of those. I've got people that can do functional and, you know, and they, so you're saying in your opinion, that usability per UI UX tester really needs to be somebody that's what they do constant 24, I mean, eight hours a day. Or do you think they can I, well, wear the multiple I, hats? So, I mean, this is a, this is a spectrum. It's not an on off switch. Right. Yeah. Uh, so to give you, to give you an example of this, I was, I, I, one of the things that I do in, in my consulting practice is I work as an expert witness on lawsuits. And, you know, I was, I was going through a case recently and I had to evaluate all of the, all of the testing that was done, every level of testing and every one of the test types uh, to be able to say that it was done competently. And, you know, I mean, I could do that. Um, you know, I'm, I would, I've got enough programming skill that I can look at J unit tests and other coded unit tests and go, yeah, that's a good unit test. Right. Yeah. And I was also able to look at the, the usability stuff that had been done. And I was able to look at the, the state and federal regulations that were applicable for this application and be able to say, yeah, that, that that's about right. You know, and I was able to look at the security testing too and go, okay, yeah, that, that that's, that's about right. Um, you know, that's, it's kind of like you go, you know, you could go to a doctor and a doctor can, a GP, right, uh, can look at you and say, okay, you have, you have condition X, whatever that is, right? Mm-hmm. And a lot of those things are sort of general and can be treated by the, the general practitioner, right? But then there's other stuff that is just like, no, I don't do that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, yes. So, so, um, you know, uh, there's, there's a spectrum here. And so I would say, you know, the more important usability is for a, for an application, for a system, the more important it is to have high caliber professionals involved, right? Just like, you know, you, you wouldn't just go to, to, to a general surgeon and say, um, I I need a heart bypass, right? You you know, uh, general surgeons can do all sorts of things. Um, and, and they can be quite good. You know, um, and a general surgeon probably could do a heart bypass. There was a guy, general surgeon at the Antarctic uh, science station down there. I got, they got snowed in and he developed appendicitis and he took out his own appendix using a wow. mirror. Um, and of course, no <laughs> anesthetics because he had to be fully aware. Right. That, so, yeah. so sure. I mean, all sorts of miraculous things can be done, but that doesn't mean that that's a good way of going about it. Right. True. So I guess it, the, the, the higher the criticality of the of of you know any of these things automation performance usability so forth the more you want yeah. somebody who's actually an expert involved so so you won me over on that one i think i need to look for a <laughs> usability tester for me now so good now do we have time for four do we want to skip to five let's let's go do? to five and then see how we do on, on okay. coming back to four so one of the things I've been presenting and, and one of the things I pulled together was quality is value to some person who matters, which is a quote from Jerry Weinberg. Um, and it's a theory that he had that, you know, a lot of times, and I'm looking for my, my note section here that won't be shown on the screen, but he talks about that different people see quality in different ways. And I've done this experiment. I've done it in conferences. I've done it um, with my teams. I've asked people to tell me what does quality mean to you? And I always challenge people, go back to your organization and ask them, what does quality mean to you? And you get a plethora of answers. Now, they they somewhat blend, but it, it's different. And, you know, I've looked at, now I'll be honest, I've studied a lot of Weinberg stuff um, in, in my career, mm-hmm. uh, but, I, but I feel like that <clears throat> What I've seen, my take from what he was saying there, and it could be totally wrong, um, is everybody sees it different. So you've got a tester who sees quality as, you know, am I delivering this um, on time? And I mean, not on time, but am I delivering it with quality? So if you tell me, I need you to test this in three days, I'm like, I need a week. And, you know, I might tell you, I can test. I can do risk-based testing. I can get this out the door. I can do this for you. But at the end of this, I'm probably not going to feel as confident that this has high quality 
uh, as you, you know, and the manager may be saying, to me, quality is getting it out the door, right? I'm meeting the client's expectations. We get it out the door. The client may be saying, hey, we got to compete with, you know, one of our competitors um, and we, we need this to go today. And that's more important to me than whether or not it works everywhere. So I saw that and that's the way I interpret it, but uh, definitely would love your intake on that because I, what I put together was kind of a little three by three mm-hmm. uh, and nine squares is saying, you know, salesperson sees quality this way. Manager sees quality mm-hmm. this way. Uh, um, everybody sees it in a different way and they kind of link together, but it's a little bit different. So what's your thoughts? So, so I would start off by agreeing with that aspect of it is that everybody has a, uh, a or, or at least different stakeholder groups will tend to have different aspects of quality that, mm-hmm. that are important to them. Um, so for example, if you're, if you're a compliance officer in an organization that's subject to regulations of some kind or another, you're going to be looking at the conformance characteristics of your product, conformance to regulations, that is going to be the number one thing, because that's the thing where if there's a hole there, you will be dealing with regulators and you will be dealing with lawsuits and you will be dealing with all sorts of unpleasant things, right? So the compliance person, you know, may not give a darn if the system is dog slow or it crashes as long as, hey, it complies with all the regulations, right? I mean, I'm exaggerating, but their primary thing is going to be exactly. regulations, right? As compared yeah. to, to somebody who, you know, is in a, in a marketing space where, you know, that to them, they may be thinking, hey, performance is everything, man. I want, I want, you know, we want minimal number of clicks to get from one place to another, right? So fast, 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 you know, and then mm-hmm. you get to try to get that person thinking about usability and they're like, well, yeah, usability is fast, right? Uh, but you know, other things they may not really think about, right? And then you you, you know, go back to the compliance person, and he or she's going to say, no, no, usability is about accessibility. Well, why is it about accessibility? Well, because we're subject to Section 508 regulations, and we've got to, you know, we've got to do that. So, so I yeah. totally get that there that there are different dimensions of, of quality, um, and that different people have different different emphasis there. Right. So there there I would agree. But here's my problem with with Weinberg as as popularly popularly interpreted and not to say you're interpreting him this way. But, you know, right. uh, the, the, the three horsemen of the apocalypse, the, the Bach brothers and Bolton, I think, do this. Uh, so they, they will kind of come. That quality is whatever you all say it is, whatever anybody says it is. And the problem with that is that, that, that there's a number of problems. One problem is that that conflates two ex- totally different things, which is features mm-hmm. and the quality of those features, right? Value to some person. Well, I may be mostly interested in, do I get the features? Um, well, some of my clients are in computer gaming, just to give an example that illustrates this. And, and um, there was some first person shooter game and I can't remember the name of it right now and probably shouldn't have brought it up any, it br- would, shouldn't bring it up anyway by specific name, but it was a first person shooter kind of game and it's a team game. So you like, it's, it's sort of like um, uh, the hunger games. If you, if you mm-hmm. saw those movies where you sort right. of, you, you're a team, but you form, there are temporary alliances that people form but ultimately there's this sort of huge crap on your neighbor thing that happens there, right? Is it, it's ultimately to mix my movie metaphors, it's like the Highlander, as I understand it, it can only be one, right? right. Um, so, and this game was super sticky. My clients, you know, and, and I'm the, the, the people building this game were not my clients, it's other, other gamers, they would play this all the time. Now that was because their, their bosses encouraged their testers and their developers to play other video games, of course, for cross pollination. And they loved this thing. And I said, well, what's so great about it? Is it like really high quality? Like, no, no, it's, it's horrible. The quality is horrible. I mean, it crashes all the time. And, and, and they gave another example too. There was a big, that big uh, craze of uh, the Pokemon, Pokemon mm-hmm. thing, uh, the, the, where yeah. you go and you, you gather stuff up. Um, right. And that, that game was so sticky 
that I, we do, we foster military working dogs uh, as a kind of a sideline because we don't have enough stuff filling up our time. But anyway, so one of the things that we found out was that there were people who were trying to play Pokemon to go gather stuff up, going into areas where they were restricted from access. And there were signs up at Lackland Air Force Base saying, if you come in here trying to pick up a Pokemon chit and you don't have any other reason to be in here, you will be court-martialed. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> it's a really sticky but at the same time that game was also notorious for just being really low quality in the sense that it crashed a lot and had you know the color wasn't real good and the, the the graphics weren't all that great but something about it it had some features some elements of it that made it mm -hmm. very very sticky very very hard to to put down right yeah clear trade-off between features and quality right and, and so Weinberg's definition muddies those things up. And that's bad because you need to get people thinking very, very clearly about, am I going to spend the time building a lot of stuff and throw a lot of spaghetti against the wall yeah. and see what sticks? Or am yeah. I going to make sure that I build the right stuff and make sure that I'm that, 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 you know, the right stuff is being built and that stuff that I deliver works, right? This is, this is, a, I think another, another manifestation of this is, this, you know, people talk about minimum, minimum viable product. No, oh, yeah. I hear people, the MVP, MVP. Oh, and I MVP, say, you know, yes. a lot of times that, uh, that acronym actually is missing two letters. It should be MVPOS uh, yeah. because <laughs> it's just, you're going to throw something out there and it is so yes. bad, you know, and they're like, oh, well, yeah, our, our, our customers will tell us, no, they won't. They'll just go away. They just won't be your customers anymore because they'll say, you know, what a piece of garbage. Right. right. Um, so, um, you know, I think uh, I think it's important to separate function functionality versus quality because there are trade offs between those. And then it's also important to think very, very crisply, in my opinion, about the different dimensions of quality. And this is as much as I'm not a huge fan of the of the standards organizations, uh, ISO and so forth. I mean, I've been, you know, inside right. inside of those to some extent, or at least what comes close enough to passing for one. So, you mm -hmm. know, this is kind of the old the old. Bismarck joke about, you know, those who respect the law and enjoy watching sausage should never see either being made. Um, the same, <laughs> the same thing applies to international standards. I can tell you it's, it's like, it's not yeah. necessarily the most appealing process, but um, the thing is that, that there is good work. It gets done. And if you look at the ISO 25,010 standard, I think it is a successor to the old ISO 9126. Sure, it's not perfect, but one of the things that it does for you is it really allows you to get some, some clarity in the way that you think about quality. And I can start thinking about, about who cares about what elements of quality, right? So it really allows me to put more structure around it than just the definition of, well, there are people out there and the people care about different things. And some of those things yeah. are features and some of those things are the quality of the features. <laughs> and I'm going to muddy all that stuff up and talk about it all at once. So that's my yeah. my um, all due respect to the late Jerry Weinberg anti Weinberg's quality definition rant and <laughs> I really prefer I, I really prefer Duran the the Duran and Crosby definitions paired to me are the right ones right so Crosby's defined quality as conformance to specifications right and his book quality is free mm -hmm. and then and Duran defined it as um, fitness for use. And if you think about those two things, those two definitions fit really, really well with, with two common concepts in the software testing business, which is verification and validation, right? So verification is about making sure that we built what we said we were going to build and, and build, and validation is about making sure that we built the right thing, right? Yeah. That, it, that it actually is, is fit for use, fit for purpose. And so to me, if I want shorthand definitions of quality, that's where I'm going to go is to Crosby and Duran. And then when we want to talk about specifics, then, then bang down into the ISO 25,010 dimensions of quality. And then, then we can get to the, and who cares about this, right? Because if the yeah. answer for any given dimension of quality is nobody cares, right? Nobody cares about this dimension. It doesn't matter. Then you can say, oh, okay, then we don't need to worry about that. Yeah. You know, I mean, accessibility isn't important for every single application necessarily, or at least not conformance to the section 508 rules right because those might not be relevant right but usability is yeah. probably going to be relevant so what aspects of usability are important so 
Anyway, you got I got I got wound up there. I'm, I'm gonna un, no, un, un, unrant myself now and let you let you respond. <laughs> so I, I, I you you actually you got me thinking about my interpretation of this and as I expected my interpretation of this kind of took my own route away from what Weinberg was saying and and it's really kind of related to what you were saying uh, in a way but not not completely so we do get the, the the two points here because what I think I've used this discussion for around qualities of per, uh, value to some person who matters is I really want to find out uh, I've worked in companies where we're doing the internal development right so it's internal if it works for us it's good and if it doesn't work it's fine it's just internal and then you do code and, and work that's delivered to consumers and now you've got a million consumers across the world that are using <laughs> it that's a different that's a different set of quality uh, values um, mm-hmm. but right now I'm working in a in a in a vendor um, situation where we we do marketing services and so our, our clients have a different and so to me what I find and this is why I always tell folks to go out and ask people what does quality mean to you what does good mean to you can they get using the agile terms what does good mean mm-hmm. um, I get a lot of different definitions you know if we ask my client today one of our one of our major clients you know what is what is what is quality to you they're like, you meet my deliverables, you you deliver my product on time, you deliver it with, you know, exactly what I want. And, and there's not a lot of discussions around what is what is what do you want? You know, mm-hmm. how do we how do we define that? Um, and and I think that's where things get skewed, because, you know, one of my team members may say, well, I think I know what they want. So <laughs> so I think when you start when you start blending them, it kind of helps me set the tone for what's important to you, right? When you meet people, you say, what do you like to do? What are your hobbies? Um, when I talk to people uh, in our in our teams, I always ask what does quality mean to you because I try to see the differences because there's differences in hobbies when you're having a social event. Mm-hmm. And to me, uh, stakeholders, sometimes I've got one. Uh-oh. One stakeholder exactly that you do and, and you deliver exactly what I want you to deliver. And I've got another one that says, quality to me is you get this thing out on time you know whatever it takes and Mm -hmm. um so i think i think it's really understand i think to me the way i interpreted this and turned this into my use within the team with this with this metrics of everybody sees quality differently is i want the team to know that if 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 my testers and my project management team and and the scrum masters and everybody on the team work together and the developers and they all understand that quality for this product means X, then we can deliver. You know, if we all mm-hmm. know we're looking at the same map, going the same direction and, and the same destination, it's good. But if your definition of good is I just got to get it done tomorrow <laughs> versus my definition is it's got to not only be done tomorrow, but it's got to work. You know, so I think I, I definitely don't think it, I don't think you, you don't have people winning, you know, so your version of my version or somebody else's version doesn't mean my version's right or your version's wrong. I just think it means if, if I know that the way you think is different than me, then now I can work with you because I know that if I'm working with you and you're a, de- a developer and I'm a tester, your, your definition, if I know your definition of quality is I get it done on time, then I know I need to probably test the crap out of your code because you're just, <laughs> you're just making sure it gets done on time. And my, mm-hmm. I'm making sure that it does what the client wants us to do. So mm-hmm. I think it, it's, it's a good way to understand, you know, but, um, but yeah, I do, I do see your point. I've, I've read up a lot on Crosby and the others um, and I, and I like their definitions as well. So it's, I think it's, it's interesting to see that, that, that dynamic between the two. I, I just, I like, I like being precise in, in, in the use of, of words and, and especially this, 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 I think the distinction between feature schedule, budget, and quality, uh, that having those mm. be clear separated buckets is, is very helpful because then I can ask people an interesting question, at least for me as a consultant. Okay. You got the four things, feature schedule, budget, and quality rank them. Uh, <laughs> no four, no fair ties. You got, you got to tell me what they are. And, I, <laughs> I have done this exercise when I've done assessments quite a bit and, and the gap between what the senior management will say and what people on the ground say is always stunning, right? So senior management will always say quality is the first thing, yeah. right? And the yeah. people on the ground will always say, no, it, <laughs> it's not always the last thing, but, but 
either mm. either schedule or budget mm. is, yes. is always going to be number one. Um, and you know, some well, in some cases, I guess features might 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 be up there, but you know, the, the idea that things will be delayed or people will spend as much money as it takes to achieve uh, you know the highest levels of quality and so forth. No, that's not they don't do that. Right. So, but I have to, I have to be specific about what I mean by quality to have that, have that trade-off conversation. Right. And then point out, guess what? Not everybody's on the same page. So you really shouldn't be surprised when, you know, what happens is not, not what you would want. Right. Because you got, you got people, you know, with, with a different perspective of what the, of what the objectives and priorities are. Right. I mean, like, I don't know if you watched any of the Olympics, but one of the things that I watched was uh, some of these, uh, uh, the rowing, the mm-hmm. team, team rowing. And, you know, the whole, obviously one of the key things there, it's, it's invisible if it's done right, but, you know, if it's done wrong, it'd become quite visible, is everybody's got to be completely in sync, yes. right? Otherwise, the boat's going to end up going sideways and it's going to end up zigzagging and you're going to lose, you know, and I think a lot of organizations, they don't take the time to get everybody in sync. And, oh, so true. you so know, true. and, you know, I mean, rowing and all rowing in the same direction is a cliche, but it it's, you know, it's an important thing to do. Like, make sure we all agree. This is what, these are what our objectives are. These are relative priorities. This is how we measure whether we're, we're achieving those effectively. This is how we measure whether we're achieving them efficiently and so forth. So again, I just like to be really precise about things because I think, uh, yeah, you know, gray areas, a lot of misunderstandings live in the gray areas. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. True. So I think we, I think we table number four for, I hope yeah. we get to do this again. I think we could do a whole 30 minute on number four. <laughs> we probably could, <laughs> but we could also do another round two on quality. As Absolutely. Well. Some person getting Absolutely. The quality, but, uh, <laughs> Yeah, let's see if we've got if we can just quickly get to a couple of questions and then we'll wrap up okay. here. So um, we've got uh, Deepshika is asking, do you think that we should do a root cause analysis of every bug? Um, uh, and I think that came in early during. Yeah, the, um, yeah. Okay, we were talking about the root cause analysis. I mean, I think just a yeah. quick answer on that one would be, I don't know that it has to necessarily be every bug, but if you're not if you're not using root cause analysis in your organization to look at what's going on with your defects in, in, in production and listening to yes. what that's telling you, you're, you're, you're really making a big mistake. Um, that'd be my take. I agree. I agree. Oh, cool. Um, let's see. You said this uh, Martin fellow works for you. Is that right? No, no. Deep chicken does. Oh, deep chicken. Okay. So, yeah. yeah so Martin, um, Mark was just basically agreeing with us there that the the illities yes. the illities are problematic and yeah problematic to get them treated seriously. He said not just usability bugs, but bugs related to any of the illities are difficult to be treated seriously and to get tested early in the test phase or spread. Okay. I take it you'd agree with that. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Dichika, if we treat the stakeholders' product as our own product, we will deliver the best quality. Um, uh, I don't know. You think, Mike? Can we, well, can, uh, can, we think think, can we think like the client that well? That's the one of the things I, I try to do with with some. One of the things I do with people, and I know I know we could talk about this one, Rex, because you and I have disagreed on this. I've I've, I've interviewed people with um, with uh, staplers, ask them to test it. Oh and yeah, right. You don't you hate that theory. <laughs> I, I know that you I don't like IQ tests. Questions. Yeah, I don't like IQ tests as interview questions. Um, I have asked them, can you test without requirements, without like details? And they'll say no. And then I'll hand them a remote control and I'll say, test this. And they'll say, Yeah, I would press the power, I'd press one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, I'd press up and down mm-hmm. channels, volume, all of that. And then when they get to the end. I say, well, I didn't give you a requirement. You know, I didn't tell you what to do. And one of the people that I said that to, they said, well, it's because I know what a remote control is. I understand the remote control. And so it got me thinking, I think that's where Deep Shik has, has talked to me a lot on this. And she talks at a lot of events as well. And that is, you know, if you can understand that product, really get yourself in the mindset of the, of the, the user of that mm-hmm. product, then it helps you to better understand whether or not, you know, it's working and, 
you know, that's one of the key things I think we try to do is, is really get yourself into that zone. You know, I'm, I'm mm. kind of channeling the user. So I think that's where she was going. No, I, I definitely buy that. Uh, one, <laughs> one point I was managing a team that we were, we were testing it. Uh, it was called Internet Appliance, which was basically like the predecessor to today's tablets, right? So it's very, very simple. It allows you to do things like read email and browse the web and check weather and that kind of stuff. Very, very simplistic, not, not a general purpose PC at all, but it was targeted specifically for people who didn't have computer savvy. The whole idea was, you know, you know, get grandpa and grandma and so forth on the web and reading, reading emails and sharing pictures with their family and so forth. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, which, you know, that sounds like ho-hum, but you know, this, we're talking about the late 1990s here. Right. So it was, kind of a big deal. And of course, my testers were technical people. And so I had to keep telling them, I, I must have said this at least once a week, maybe a couple of times a week. Remember that you are not the customer. You are not the customer. You need you, you are more technically sophisticated than the customer. And things that make sense to you, behaviors that make sense to you will not make sense to them. Um, yes, they yes. won't understand why they can't just push the button and all of a sudden there's the internet. And they won't understand what a 404 is. And yes. they, won't, they won't understand what it means when you get an error message that says, can't find object. Because um, they're going to be wondering, they're going to be looking around on their desk, like what fell off my desk? What object got lost, right? Yes. All right. Because yes. <laughs> they don't do object-oriented programming. I said, do not develop a tolerance for any of these kinds of things. If you, you know, channel somebody in your life who is a complete technical novice who knows nothing, and ask yourself, how would they react to this, right? Um, and it, it was a constant thing. It was a constant, I had to constantly kind of reprogram them on this. And, you know, I would, I would be talking to them about a bug and they would start explaining the failure mode behind it. And I would say, user doesn't care. User doesn't care. User can't understand. So don't, don't, don't think that way because just thinking about that stuff is just going to get you explaining it away, you know? So yes. I guess that that's, I, I would, I would buy if, if, what Deepshika is getting at there is we got to try to put ourselves into the customer's shoes to relate to what they're going to say is good or bad. And yep, I'm, I'm with it. Yeah. Well, I'm happy. I'm, I'm happy Deepshika is here. Um, I also have Kelly McLaughlin. She's on my team in the U S cool. uh, we have 11 others in you in India. Um, and I'm I see probably several not down here. Down. Yeah. <laughs> and I see Robin and, and Robin Goldsmith and Yuri Makadanov. Um, I know both of those. So if I don't know you and I see your name here, um, definitely reach out and connect with me because I'd love to connect with these folks. Um, you're doing the right thing coming to one of Rex presentations because I've been following Rex for two decades now, I think. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's, it, you're doing the right thing on a Friday afternoon. So <laughs> <laughs> We don't usually do them on a Friday afternoon, but being that this is Friday the 13th, it seemed fortuitous. Absolutely. It's, it was perfect. Some sort of QA kind of way, you know, like you can't, <laughs> You can't do something on a Friday the 13th. When can you do it? Um, well, cool. I'm going to go ahead and wind us down. We're, we're only 20 minutes over schedule. So, yeah. you know, going back to one of our earlier questions, why is your estimate so long? Um, That's right. Why did we do such a crappy job of predicting how long this was going to last? I don't know. This um, got interesting. Um, anyway, yeah. Um, the good metric was that we didn't we didn't lose a whole lot of people. Uh, we you know we're only down even at this point three from the uh, peak attendee number. So uh, I guess we were we were entertaining not only to ourselves but to others. So that's Absolutely. good. Absolutely. Um, so everybody, thank you for coming. Um, I hope uh, that all of you enjoyed this free webinar from RBCS. We do these free webinars as a service to the software testing community because at RBCS we are a not just for profit company. Um, uh, sometimes our profits are better and sometimes they're worse, but they need to be something because otherwise we go away and become a non-company, uh, <laughs> become a former company. <laughs> so if you enjoy our free webinars and feel that they demonstrate solid insights into the kinds of testing challenges you face, please make RBCS your preferred software testing vendor for any and all expert services, consulting, or training. Uh, we're happy to provide a quote for any such help you might need. So you can contact us at all the coordinates you see here, the best place to start for a quote is the email info at rbcs-us.com. Um, so that's, uh, that does it for the webinar. Uh, Mike, uh, thanks again for uh, yeah. 
agreeing to do this and for the stimulating uh, discussion. And, really and I would say it. to everybody, buy this guy's book. He literally wrote the book on testing. So <laughs> I've got two signed copies. So <laughs> it, it's great. It's great to know you, Rex. Great to great to work with you these many years. So it's been well, great. Thanks very much, Mike. Uh, and glad to hear you're you're staying busy and and uh, staying staying healthy in these kind of weird days. But uh, absolutely. Um, Someday or another, we'll probably be at a conference in person and uh, yes. see each other in person again. So I look forward to that. Thank you very much. Thanks, folks. All right. Thanks, everybody.